If you're an athlete, you know the greatest motivator of all is the fear of letting your teammates down. After all, a team is only as good as its weakest link. So you owe it to those wearing the same jersey as you to be your best every time you step on the field. That's why there's no vape in team. When you vape, you can expose your lungs to toxic chemicals that can damage your lungs. If you're a step behind, the team's a step behind. Brought to you by The Real Cost and the FDA. Maybe 50 people in the world who make a living, right. like a decent living at this, right? Yep. So you're not going to work your day job, right? Whatever that is, creative or not. And when you have a good game idea that suits a game that can be made into a game, go do it because it's fun and it's cool and it's a little extra scratch. And, you know, maybe it says something that that turns people on. And they're like, wow, that's really good. I think Ian does one of the best jobs of explaining to me what the need many designers have to create and that desire to get something out in the world. I was surprised to hear the game that Ian uses when he tries to transition D&D players to try other better games. I enjoyed his breakdown of action movies as a genre, and it shows how much work he's put into it. The core concept of playing the actor in an action movie versus just the action hero really makes action movie world unique. Now, Ian is a neighbor here in the North Carolina Triangle area, and he continues my contention that Central North Carolina is the ley line crossing for RPG design. And I love talking to people that are passionate about something. Ian is passionate about action movies. Now, support from my patrons on Patreon is why this episode is possible. Quick shout out to a few of the people that have supported me all the way back since October of 2019. Thanks to all of you, Jesse Ellis, the Nick Westbrook, Good old Jim Ortiz, my buddy Keith Suderman, DZ Dane Leergaard, Matt Burdoff, Wookie Gunner, and Voslev. Okay, sit back, relax, enjoy an action packed conversation with Ian. Hey there, Ron from the Dungeon Society. When I'm not making customized 5e D&D content or printing 3D tabletop miniatures at home, I'm listening to Tabletop Talk. Welcome. Howdy friends, Craig here. Today I'm talking with author, designer, and contributor to Flatland Games, Ian Williams. When Ian isn't creating for Flatland Games, he is writing for Jacobin, the Guardian, Paste, Vice Sports, and The Point. Flatland Games is the home of Action Movie World, First Blood, and the supplement Deleted Scenes. Ian, welcome to the third floor. Thanks for having me, Craig. And uh, just to add, uh, uh, I, uh, I've moved from public writing. I'm, I'm now an instructor and doctoral candidate at the UNC Chapel Hill Department of Communication. So uh, don't look for too much of my stuff, although I still <laughs> dabble every now and then. So that that's where I did my undergrad as uh, at UNC. <laughs> nice, awesome. So I'm yeah. a Tar Heel now. Now are now I got to understand what degree of Tar Heel you are. Are you a Tar Heel like watch basketball and do the whole thing or? Um, I used to be. Um, I'm a North Carolina lifer, which is rare for the Triangle uh, anymore. Um, and I grew up a massive UNC fan in the days of uh, King Rice and J.R. Reed. God, I knew I liked you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't, I don't, I don't watch a lot of basketball or American sports. I gave my heart to uh, international soccer and kind very of cool. Stuff. But I keep my, up with it. I, yeah, I, um, I'm not as passionate as I used to be about it. Obviously, I used to live and breathe it when I went to school there, and yeah, over the <clears throat> couple decades since I went to school there, uh, you know, I, I don't, I'm not as avid. But um, so let's before we even get into anything. So my wife has also become a football fan. And okay. you, I'm, I'm willing to guess what TV show has made her a football fan. Um, Ted Lasso. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Does that <laughs> mean she's a Spurs fan? <laughs> so she, not only has it been Ted Lasso, but then she found, uh, the show with, um, uh, guy was the Deadpool actor. Um, Ryan Reynolds. Yeah. So she found the Ryan Reynolds show where he is kind of a pseudo reality show where he bought the team over there in England yeah. and stuff between those two. She has become a huge football fan. But the benefit was, is that I got I never watched the World Cup just and, yeah. and it's it's funny because like when I sit and watch football, soccer, I thoroughly enjoy it. Right. Because, oh, you yeah. know, and, and you have to know a little bit about the sport, I think, to enjoy watching it live. If you know nothing about the sport, you don't understand what's happening. 
Um, so she's like, honey, this is the world cup. I'm like, you know what? Screw it. I'm going to grab a beer and I'll, I'll sit and watch it with you. That like, if I don't know if I can watch another world cup match after the, what, <laughs> what we no, just the saw. Final, the final was outrageous. Just absolutely unbelievable. Outrageous. Like scripted. Yeah. Unbelievable. It was great. Um, so yeah, you, you and I are neighbors. Um, and it's funny because the more, uh, guests I'm having on, the more people I'm realizing are, are in our area here in the triangle. We had Jason Morningstar on, of course. Uh, yeah. and then, uh, I just had another designer who's going to be on the show later. He, uh, his name is also Craig. He's going to be on the show. So I'm de- declaring this the epicenter of, of the RPG world. Just, uh, be prepared. Oh yeah. No. And I think that you, I think you, you totally can. Cause, um, uh, I, I know we're delaying the intro questions, but like it was always fascinating to me uh, in my teenage years and, and, and into my 20s, like how many designers were from North Carolina, like half the old White Wolf crew was from yep. here. Um, uh, his, his name's escaping me, and I know that he's he's actually uh, uh, famous, but uh, uh, the guy who runs uh, Hero uh, lives in Greensboro. I did not know that. Oh, yeah. He's lived there for like 40 years. I think he's still in the area. He used to be a lawyer and he did hero on it on the side. Oh, I've got to track him down. Oh, no kidding. God, I didn't realize that. Yeah. Um, uh, and uh, uh, a lot of the old White Wolf crew moved into local video game developments like Justin Achille is here and Ryan Dansky who did Wraith. And yeah, it's it's always been kind of a, kind of a hotbed. That's cool. That's very, very cool. Um, and that's where I did a lot of my gaming was at, at Carolina, which uh, had a pretty good. I mean, you got to remember, this is the the 90s uh, or well, yeah. yeah, the 90s when I was in college. And uh, that's back when we had to have a, a per, we pretended nobody played games and then we all played games in the basement. But uh, there was, you know, there was an RPG club and uh, White Wolf, all of the uh the White Wolf stuff was huge back when I was oh, yeah. in the mid nineties there when I was at school. All right. So enough of that. Let's um, let's start off with the standard question, Ian, which I'm sure you've been asked a million times, which is uh, how you found gaming. But let's phrase it a little bit different. There was a time where you knew nothing about role playing games. You knew nothing about grabbing a set of dice, a sheet of paper and pretending to be somebody else. And it was put in front of you for the first time. When did that happen? Can we go back there? Yeah, um, it was actually twofold, and there was like kind of a gap, maybe of two, three years. And the first one was, um, I got Dungeons and Dragons books before I knew what Dungeons and Dragons was. So when I learned to tie my shoes, my parents went to the bookstore and they knew I liked monsters, and they bought the first edition A D and D monster manual for me. Okay, and gave it to, me. and I'm like four, and uh, they didn't know that it had like boobs and demons and stuff they were just like oh a monster manual i bet you ian will really like that and, you know like i colored the little black and white drawings and stuff oh that's awesome a few years later um uh, uh I, I kept getting these books because i had an uncle by marriage um uh, i had an aunt who got married fairly young um and uh, like i think they were still teenagers even and this uncle by marriage was like really into michael moorcock books so mm. Elric, and um uh he had uh, the Fiend Folio and Deities and Demigods, right? Which I think he got into it because he just really loved Elric stuff. And like when they moved, he just kind of gave me the books. But like I still didn't know what to do with them. I knew that there was like kind of this game attached. So the first game that I actually played was TMNT and Other Strangeness. Oh, um, God, what a great first game. Holy shit. Right. Which is which is weird because like most people come into it by like red through red box D and D like like people in their forties and that was very shortly thereafter where like a friend gave it to me at middle school because you're like my mom thinks this is satanic and like do you want it and I was like hell yeah I do um, but like I was I, I was playing I was hanging out with my best friend Noah and he had TMNT and he'd not really played it so we just started playing it and being like you know I don't even know like ten years old eleven something like that. Um, you know, it's like all these like preteen, young teen boy fantasies where like we would just kind of like read this. Like it was just us. So we would each yeah. make like a gaggle of like randomly generated, uh, you know, mutant guys. And then we were like, OK, so what's the most what's the coolest thing we can do? OK, so first of all, we're going to read through um, the uh, the spoilers of what whatever their adventure supplement was. I can't remember what it was. It was like TMNT Adventures, right? Yeah. It was a slim volume. Um, and we were like, OK. So we're going to go through it, even though we know the answers, and then we're going to get, like, really powerful. And then we're going to come up with our own stories. We came up with, like, um, a mutant, like, supremacist breakaway group <laughs> where, um, you know, we, we also had TMNT. Where, like, eventually we got TMNT uh, goes Hollywood or Truck and Turtles, right, where they where they drive across 
America. And we were like, okay, so like they have a semi truck and they take the semi truck to Antarctica and they make. Uh, How do they get the truck to Antarctica? Yet? Listen, I, <laughs> that's not important. The important thing is that they did. Um, and they made a base filled with. Um, like honestly, like this is really fraught because, like, knowing what I do now as an adult, I'm like, oh god, were were we living like some like post World War II UFO Nazi fantasy, like where we made a base in Antarctica? <laughs> but it wasn't like all that. Like it was fairly innocent. We were just, you know, being being stupid kids. But yeah. that's that's where it started, and like everything unfolded from that. And then I went like D and D. I found White Wolf. I I got Vampire just on a lark the day it came out, and then uh, wow. the first edition. I still got a copy. Um. And it just kind of proceeded and unrolled from there. So there's two things that usually happen here. And as I have these origin story discussions with designers, um, one is the person who never let go. So even through high school, secondary school, early job, working, trying to start a career, this was always a part of their life. And then there's other people that are like me who took, you know, a 15, 20 year break and then found it again. Which which bucket do you fall in? Uh, I never gave it up. Yeah, I never gave it up. I mean, you know, what I want out of games has changed you know, multiple times. What uh, changed it? You know. um, I think like I just got kind of frustrated. There, there was this period in the 90s, um, uh, which to me is kind of the golden age of gaming because people could actually make a living at it, like, like right. multiple <laughs> studios, right? They had um, health insurance. <laughs> yeah, right. You know, I've, I've, I've had this argument with like my, my, my indie game design friends where I'm like, no, like, you know, it was actually good to like be able to go to the dentist, um, you know, and have like 20 studios that could do that. Um, but, but I did get frustrated um, with the crunchiness of the systems at some point because, mm-hmm. you know, as, as I got more and more into White Wolf games, which White Wolf ate my life from the time I was, you know, World of Darkness stuff, but from like 1991 to 2003, like that was the bulk of what I actually played, although I bought a wide variety of games. Um, and in the process, I just kind of got frustrated with, with, with the crunchy games, right? Yep. You know, and we and we have different ways of understanding those now. Um, uh, at, you know, through places like the Forge and and stuff like that. But um, ultimately, I just kind of fell away, and I was like, I, you know, I don't, I don't necessarily want to be like a theater kid. You know, right. I didn't want that, right? But I was like, I want kind of a cozy, um, simultaneously like fast paced, like I, like I want to get done in like three hours. I don't want to have mm-hmm. like a marathon session, but I want it to be intense, right? Like, I, and I want to do it with friends right like people that i would want to hang out with not not at a store not with like a pickup group or anything like that so that's the kind of game that uh really drew my attention in which i became fixated on. so as you're exploring this right you identify you know i enjoy this hobby there's things about what i'm playing today that's kind of turning me off a little bit you have a sense of what you want to find looking back on it now do you what was the game Right. When did you finally realize, oh, shit, there's games being made that 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 fit what I need? Oh, you remember wow. What, um, one of those first games. The blue. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it was um, I think it was white. Well, I, I think it was just white wolf stuff in general. Yeah. I mean, like, like I said, so I I, I remember um, you're from the area. So do you remember Hung Gates? Oh, God. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. So for those I've got who a don't whole know, it's a story, but I'm, oh, not yeah, I've, it's, I've it's got weird. multiple. All right, so real quick, that's how I got into the beta for uh, Magic the Gathering. There you go. Okay. Because I was bartending at Slugs at the Pines in Chapel Hill, which is a okay. restaurant that's long gone. You may or may not remember. It's the a steakhouse. I was a bartender there. The manager of the Hungate's Hobby Store uh, was a drunk and used to come in almost every night after work. And uh, he knew I was a geek. And uh, he's like, yeah, he goes, I, you know, I've got this distributor who's trying to get people to, to try out this game, this card game. And I gee, like, if I give you some, will you, will you give it a rip? And I'm like, yeah, whatever. And he hands, hands them to me. And I'm like, what the fuck is this? And like, yeah. it was printed, like typeface, like printed That's instructions excellent. and stuff like that. And I remember taking it home to my role playing group friends so that back at the apartment, and we're like, let's figure this out. 10 hours later. Yeah. Right. <laughs> we're like, holy shit this game is unbelievable and uh yeah so all right that's really funny that you said Hungates. sorry no, like, like like Hungates is legendary and, and for people who don't have context like Hungates with this was a southeastern hobby store chain that had a pretty decent selection of yep. rpgs and, and and they were the rpgs that they had varied widely from yes. store to store so it wasn't like there was like a central distributor who was sending the same stuff to every store like they would have really weird niche stuff so I'd bought 
Call of Cthulhu in 1990 or 1991, whenever uh, Vampire came out. And I just kind of went and I, like I'd read Interview with the Vampire and stuff like that. Um, and uh, I'd gone there and uh, I saw Vampire and th- they didn't have the Call of Cthulhu book I wanted. And I was like, oh, I'll buy this. You know, I, I got allowance money. And, you know, when you're 13 years old, it's like, no, you you must spend money immediately as soon as you get it. So I bought it and then I was just, uh, I was just entranced by it. And uh, um, it was that, and then like really far afield from that, I I have a lifelong obsession with Warhammer. And in fact, I'm doing my dissertation Mm -hmm. on, uh, on, on miniatures as media. Interesting. Um, And specifically like how they're made. So that's, that, that's like the other prong of it. There's like this visual one. And I bring that up because you know, a lot of people play role-playing games with miniatures. This is kind of dual obsession with World of Darkness and Warhammer, which don't have a lot in common, allowed me to, I think, separate those two realms, right? So, like, when I play a role-playing game, I don't want to play it as a war game. I don't want miniatures, don't want a map or anything like that. I love Warhammer and miniatures, skirmish games from non-games workshop people. That's that realm. So it allowed me to just say, I get my crunch over here, and then I get my, you know my amateur improv acting and like being all dark or like whatever uh, on the other side. Yeah. I'm completely aligned with that. And I've had that discussion with people because they asked me like, Craig, why are you into the crunchier stuff? And I said, because I get that playing like Malifaux and MCP and Warhammer. Yeah. And they like, that's where I get my battle maps and my, you know, pulling out rulers and measuring squares from, um, I don't need it in my role-playing games. That's also why I don't slight those that get it in, both in their role playing game, right? Yeah, yeah. It's 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 not for me, and like I'll fully admit, like I don't really understand. Like I have these friends who are like, yeah, I need miniatures for my Pathfinder or my role play or, or whatever. And I, I'm like, you know, do you want to play like Necromunda or something? You know, something kind of small scale. You know, maybe like ten. They're like, no, 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 not for yeah. me. Yeah, and yeah. Well, and it's funny too because now there's miniature games that really blur that line, so you look like like Frosthaven and. Um, yeah. there's a lot of games that are, uh, that are miniature games. They're tactical miniature games, but they have a heavier role playing element and a character centered element to it. Um, and it's interesting. Yeah. I mean, in the same way that if we went to some of our miniature buddies and said, Hey, you know, you want to check out, you know, this role playing game. And they're like, yeah, no, no, yeah. no, 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 that's not, that's not what I'm going to do. I've got those buddies where I'm like, yep. no, li- no, literally there's a 40 K role playing game. Do you want to give it a whirl? And they're like, oh man, this is not, not going to work. Okay. Yeah. No, they just don't have an interest. Now you mentioned the forge. So unlike me and you, there was an entire revolution that happened while I was asleep. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the, just the, the landscape changed. Um, the forge was a big part of that. Um, you were active in the hobby, uh, at the time. Did you fall into that, um, community? Um, like when did you start seeing, games being made different like do you were you there when apocalypse world came out and did you did you gronk that yeah I'll, although i i was very peripheral like i didn't go to the forge or anything like that where, where i intersected with it was on google plus which right. if if anybody remembers and I, I wrote an article about it for waypoint uh over at vice and it was about the death of google plus right when they finally pulled the plug and there was just such a vibrant community and through some combination of being interested in a variety of different t- types of games and through political discussions and stuff like that i befriended a lot of the people who were very active on the forge. Um, so Vincent, um, I haven't, I haven't hung out with Jason Morningstar in, in, in a good long while, um, just because we all fell away from kind of that central location. Yeah. Um, uh, Brett Gillen uh, is, is, is a good friend of mine. Uh, Nathan Pauletta. Um, I, I, I was uh, the editor on, I think the last three games he did. Um, so um, I, I befriended all these people, so I kind of got it by osmosis, right? I, I don't, um, you know, I'm, I'm proud of my work, but I, I'm not really like a, a master. Yeah, well, I'm, yeah, I'm not, I'm not a game design genius or anything like that. I, I understand the theories and stuff, but I, you know, that kind of stuff has, has never been for me, um, which is why I didn't make my own system, right? It's not about laziness; it's because I'm enumerate. Yeah, <laughs> well, yeah. And if you can, if you can realize your dream, and we'll get into that when we talk about it. But if you can realize your dream by building off of somebody else, or like that's yeah. that's what we do, right? Well, so what's interesting, and the question I I, I always ask is. I mean, I, I've been an, a, a long time GM. I created the table every time. Um, I, you know, I create worlds, I create images, I create scenes. Uh, so do you when you run games. What's different between you and me, though, is you 
felt the need to create outside of the table, beyond the table. You, you felt an urge to create a game. And I want to get a sense of, do you know when that itch started to surface and you, you had to start scratching it? Yeah, I just, I, I had this idea. It's, it's really funny. So, you know, I mentioned uh, 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 Brett, Brett and uh, uh, Gillen. And like I said, he's, he's a friend of mine. And we were chatting one night online and I said, man, I, I really like Apocalypse World, but wouldn't it be awesome if there were like an action movie version of it? And he was like, what do you mean? Like, what are you thinking? I said, so what if it was a world where all the action movies are real? So, it's, you know, there's like predators and, you know, you know, that kind of thing. And he said, I'm going to be honest with you. I think that idea sucks. And I was like, what do you mean that idea sucks? Why would you say that? And he said, I think a better idea because action uh, apocalypse world is aims to emulate specific forms of fiction, certain genres. What if you played the actors that were in the movies? Just a thought. And then I went, I was like, that sounds stupid. I'm not doing that. And then I sat down and I thought about it. And, you know, it was one of those overnight things. And I was like, no, actually, that sounds like a really good idea. Right? <laughs> like, that's, that sounds like a really good idea. So I started thinking about it, right? And I've always done kind of work in an academic adjacent vein, right? So I started really thinking about what makes action movies work. Why are mm-hmm. action movies the way that they are? And... I didn't see a lot of games that did that. I saw I saw plenty of games that did in whole or in part what I thought I wanted to do. Right. Which Brett was right, was a terrible idea. Um so then I realized that no, I actually want to get this I, I, I want to get this out. You know, it, it it seemed that I had something salient to say about action movies in addition to making what I think is a fun game. Um and, and I hear that a lot, Ian. Um, that phrase. And I think it's, it's very interesting for people who don't design games. And that is the, I needed to get this out phrase, um, that you just said, can can you give us a sense for those of us that, that, that don't have that hunger? Like, what is that? What is that? I have something to say. Oh, wow. Um, I just think about media a lot. Right. And that's, and that's functionally my job now is because I do media studies over at Chapel Hill. Um, and it just seemed that so so for me right and this is going to be specific and this may head off another question but i when, when i was thinking about what makes action movies tick primarily what you hear is that it's masculinity it's violence and it's patriotism and i thought well what if it's what if it's something physical right in the sense that it's not just that things blow up and people fight Right. But it's, you know, it's that famous scene between Carl Weathers and Arnold Schwarzenegger where they, you know, they, they, you say, son of a bitch, you know, and it zooms in on that. And that's friendship. Right. right. And it's this very kind of maybe narrow um, version of a male friendship. Yep. But it's expressed physically. And when you look across action movies, there's that that's the commonality. Right. Whether it's a sex scene or it's violence or it's friendship, or it's laughing, right? You know, action movie heroes tend to have very big laughs, right? And they let you know when you're happy. Yeah. It's Red Brown, which is my favorite playbook, who just yells all the time, right? Like yelling is an embodied, <laughs> very physical thing. It's not just noise and words, right? You yeah. have to, you have to bellow. You have to feel yourself. And that was my venue for doing that. Right. I mean, I, sh- I should mention, right. And that, that, that I had designed a game for Greg Stafford, which, uh, uh, is, it's, uh, who's Greg Stafford? The of, Gr- Greg Stafford did. Okay. I never want to presume. Um, you uh, like, holy shit. Who is this guy? <laughs> like, wait a minute. Like, no, so, it's okay. Cause he, you know, I mean, I mean, you never know. And we all have like different, uh, you know, no I'm judgments. Sorry, I, so, I, I derailed your story. You're designing for Greg. No, 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 no. It's good. Yeah. Okay. So, um, and, and, and it's kind of lost in this development hell since his, since his death. And it's, you know, it's with yeah. chaosium now, but he, but he was doing towards the end of his life last, you know, 2010, 2011, he'd done a call for, um, uh, different uh, Pendragon settings, right? Using the rule set for other stuff. And I think one made it to market, which is Paladin, right? And mm-hmm. I said, I, you know, I decided to pitch him. And this is the first thing I ever wrote for anybody. 2010, I'm 33 years old, right? And I say, hey, uh, gaming hero, Greg Stafford. Yeah, right. 
would you be interested in a Bronze Age game, right? Like where we did Bronze Age Greece. And he was like, I love that idea. Send me, uh, send me a chapter outline. And I was like, oh, shit. Okay. Anyway, all that it was just to say that I had this, I had this idea of the way that things could be expressed, right? Whether it's Bronze, bronze Age or action movies, right? Mm-hmm. And at the time, the only venue that I had was through game design. Right? And I mean, I, I have other avenues now and it doesn't, which, you know, doesn't mean that I won't revisit it at some point, right. but it is to say that at the time that that was how I did it. I didn't have a choice, but I had this gnawing idea that I want to say something about how these things work. And I hope it's novel enough and different enough that it's not just another role playing game, right? Which isn't to just other role playing games, but it's just that that's, it's not something I want to do. I never wanted to make a career out of it. I, I never not not once I thought, oh, I'm going to go be a role playing game designer, right? Um, it, it was just I, I view these things as one offs when I'm like, yeah. oh, I need to get that out as a game. But 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 as a one off, was it satisfying? Did did, yeah. did you did you get it out? Yeah, very satisfying. Very yeah. Uh, yeah I mean, I, I get the question every now and then. I'm like, hey, are uh, are you going to do another supplement for Action Movie World? You know, we've got one deleted scene, and um, I say no. I mean, I, I don't think I am. I mean, yeah. I never say never, but no, like, like I got it out, you know, I got that out. It's on the page. I, you know, I said what I wanted to say with it. Well, now this is going to be, this is going to sound asinine. I don't mean it to, but wh- why would you come on my podcast then? Why would you sit here and talk to me about it? If it's, if, if that ship sailed. Because I love talking about games and That's I'm happy cool. to answer questions. Right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I, you know, I love, I love games. Right. Um, uh, I always leave the door open. I don't think I have like fans like eagerly waiting to get to see Williams production or anything like that. Um, if you're there, like, you know, send me a DM, I'll buy you a beer. Um, or actually, actually, wait a minute. No, you buy me a copy. You, you buy a copy of Action Movie World, then you buy me a beer. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, um, yeah, it's just, I, I, you know, I still do, you know, a hefty side of, of game studies and thinking hard about games. Right. Right. Um, and that's maybe where that energy went, but, um, and, and maybe, maybe less kind of nitty gritty, but like anybody can do it, you know? Right. And I think, I I think hearing somebody say, you know what, you don't need to commit to this for like 30 years. If you have a good idea for a game, like go do it. Yeah. I I think that's a huge message and a huge message uh, to put out there because I mean, when we were kids and I'm, I'm older than you, but, but I think you can, you can sympathize with this. I mean, the names in the back of the books, then th- those people were, were gods to us, you oh, know, yeah. cause you, you, cause there wasn't podcasts. There wasn't, you know, there, you, there was nothing even tangential to get in contact with them except maybe letters and, and stuff like that. And, and, and there was a certain mystique put around them. And um, I'll be honest, when I started this podcast and started talking to designers, like I was nervous when I had Vincent and McGay on the show. Mm-hmm. I was nervous when I had John Harper on the show, like uh, Ed Greenwood, you know, when he came on the show, like these are people. And then Lena quickly, like they became friends. Right. And quickly I realized, oh, oh that's right. They're just people, too. And yeah. it, it, it's very easy to mystify. And this doesn't take away from brilliant design or being a creative or anything, but it, but it's easy to mistakenly say they're something different than me. They're not. They just did it. And you haven't yet. Yeah. Yeah, well said. I, you know, you just if if you have an idea and it suits a game, right? You know, not not every idea that you're going to have. It, games are a medium; they're not the medium, right? I'm not one yeah. of those people who thinks that games are uniquely good or you know uniquely well equipped for education. I, you know, I think they're good at those things, but I don't think they're unique in any kind of <laughs> way, except in the way that everything's unique, right? That's the, <laughs> right. The sure, sure. I, you know. Um, it, and and what that means is, is that like not every idea you're going to have needs to be a game, right? Right. So just do the game ideas as they come. Because like, you know, again, to, to, to kind of reiterate something that, you know, I jokingly said is like nobody, it, it, there's like maybe 50 people in the world who make a living, right. like a decent living at this, right? Yep. So you're not going to work your day job, right? Whatever that is, creative or not. And when you have a good game idea that suits a game, that can be made into a game, go do it because it's fun and it's cool. And it's a little extra scratch. And, you know, maybe it says something that, that turns people on and they're like, wow, that's really good. 
Mm-hmm. Like, I highly doubt that Vincent, when he wrote Apocalypse World, knew what was going to happen. Right. I, I agree. Yeah. And he they even said that right? when I talked to them, they even said that. And it um, what, what's interesting is when we put Apocalypse World in the context of the timeline, it's seismic. Right. Yeah. But for them, they're just like, this is just, you know, what? let's like, here's a like the first thing he did was create a playbook. Yeah, that was the that was the beginnings of it all. Right. And and they were just for lack of a better word, they were effing around. And in the same way they do now, they just kind of put shit out in the ether and they say, hey, here's what I'm screwing around with right now. Um, You know, the most recent stuff that uh, Vincent specifically has been putting out um, is so different. I mean, I've been backing he's these little Kickstarters he's been doing uh, for for his latest design kind of uh, thread he's been pulling. I've been backing him and getting them and reading them and going, I don't know if I know what he's doing. Yeah. Right. And and it's possible that it's a dead end or it's possible that 20 years from now, there's going to be a podcast talking about, do you remember when that came out the same way we're talking about it? It, It's, it's all very, very interesting. Um, Ian. So it it sounds like with your dissertation, especially as, as the focus right now, um, is it safe to say that you are actively playing miniature games right now? Oh yeah. No, yeah. way too many. And I spend too much money on them. And uh, <laughs> they are, they are a sink, aren't they? <laughs> I mean, it, you know, it's, it's, it's weird. So like I, I worked at games workshop retail arm, uh, like in 2000, uh, you know, so I was like 22 or 23 years old and it was one down, down in Concord mills down by Charlotte. Oh yeah. Um, and uh, I remember God, the pitch. I guarantee we've met. We almost certainly have. I yeah. guarantee we have. Yeah, you probably came through there and bought some dwarves. Some, <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah. So, you know, the pitch that we were told, and I, I, I think that they still make the pitch, um, but I don't know how forcefully, but the forceful, the forceful pitch was, you know, I, I, I think the Xbox had just come out. So like curious parents would come by with their kids and stuff. And kids would see, you know, a 40 K box set. And of course, you know, we're salespeople trying to push it. Go, I want this at that time. Uh, you know, it was like 60, $70. And we were always supposed to say, look, your kid's going to buy that video game for like $60 and then you're going to play it for like three weeks and then you're going to be out. Money, okay. Maybe your kid buys 40 K and doesn't like it. Okay. But odds are that once they have picked up this box, they're already like invested in the little figures and like the idea of this kind of spatial movement around games and like cool guns and stuff like that. You're going to get more of your money's worth. And that was always a line to me in 2000. It was something I had to say. But as I've gotten older, like, I really don't feel that bad about spending money on miniatures. No. Because it, no. It, as a pastime, it eats up a lot more of my time than whatever video game I just picked up on a Steam sale. I, I, I've said that about many games, and it's even more so in RPG games. The dollar to entertainment value that we get out of both of those hobbies is, is unmatched absolutely unmatched right you, you it's a one-time spend and it's just it's never ending game it, you only stop playing when you stop playing not because you got to the end of the game that, that that's not the case with either of them but how about role-playing games do you still like do you have a group that you play with do you yeah um so um i started up a new group I, a new group i, I kind of not played for a couple of years once i entered my uh doctoral program in 2019 um I, I used to work for Funcom, who did Age of Conan video game company, and uh, I, I played with all those guys. And um, we started doing uh, Gloomhaven. Right? Nice. And weirdly, we hit a cul-de-sac with that, and we all left, like kind of hating it. <laughs> and that kind of like broke up the ga- that kind of broke up the group. But also, a lot of people were like moving and going on to different jobs and like yep. different towns. So I was kind of adrift for a year and a half. You know, COVID happened and stuff like that. So I was like, okay, well, I'm not really playing any role playing games too much. I played a little bit with my brother in Greensboro, um, who's you know kind of a regular. Um, but then I put together a group, um, you know, at school um, and. Uh, it's been going well. We did uh, the One Ring Second Edition. Uh, we did the Free League. Uh, uh, yeah, the Free yeah. League version. Um, what do you think? Did, uh, I like it. Um, it's it's a tighter design game than First Edition, but I'll be honest, I actually like First Edition better. That's okay. Um, for kind of the opposite reason, I kind of like messy games. Sure, I like I, I like games that have a lot of kind of like fiddly bits and stuff. Not like hyper mechanical ones because I still hold to that. I don't want that in my role playing games, but I, I like it when there are kind of superfluous mechanics which make things evocative that sure. I have to kind of pay attention to. You know, if I forget, we did Heart. Um, oh, that's we, so good. 
Yeah, we started Wolf Rup, but then, um, uh, but then a couple people had to drop because their schedules changed. Um, but I'm pretty steady now. Uh, I play in Chapel Hill once a week, and we just started Apocalypse World, actually. And are you driving them to not play D anD D, or is that have you found a group that says? Oh, yeah. No, I told them I won't run it. <laughs> I gave him a list of 10 games. I said, this is the rough order, but I'm happy, you know, that I would prefer to game master, right? Cause I'm the perpetual game master. I'm very picky about like the flow of games. And yeah. How play. And, um, and how are they doing playing oh, something different? Great. Yeah. Every single time, every single time, I swear, I'm not making this up. I have had maybe four or five instances. Cause like, you know, my groups tend to be pretty steady, but four or five instances where we incorporate somebody new who only have, they've only ever played Dungeons and Dragons or Pathfinder. Right. And invariably we say like the most we do is, you know, with the flatland guys, uh, you know, we had somebody and we did some OSR stuff. Uh, I can't remember what it was. It may have been like Labyrinth Ford or something. Like that. Um, but every single time when we get them into kind of rules, light, you know, gaming of any stripe, always those new people whose only frame of reference is Dungeons and Dragons say, gosh, you know what? I'm really glad that we're not playing Dungeons and Dragons. Get out. I'm really glad that like we're doing like this is great and I didn't know that role playing games could be like this every single time. What do they cite? So when you when you when you dig into that like w- w- what do they not miss and what do they love? I'm trying not to speak pejoratively of Dungeons of and course. Dragons. No, 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 no. Because no, no. Cause, because 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 I get it, right? And like I think 5th edition is a pretty decently designed game for fun, right? But I think ultimately it doesn't do anything. Right at this point, I, I I can say up until third edi- early third edition, Dungeons and Dragons was emulating something very specific, right? Which was kind of, you know, this kind of slow power arc of you know once once you were scared of goblins and kobolds, right, and you were a dungeon rat, and now you're kind of powerful and you have a castle, right? And then it suddenly became this game about demigods and essentially you were playing a brand, right? Yep. And some people love playing the brand and I get it, right? And thank but, God it's popular. Yeah. And, but, but once, once that shift happened, I was like, I, I, don't, I don't know what I'm playing here. I don't understand what Dungeons and Dragons is trying to do. I don't know what Dungeons and Dragons fifth is trying to do. Yeah. Like the rules, the rules are decent, but what is it? Is it a game where you get a bunch of loot, right, and become, you know, a god tier guy. Um, I think it's okay for that, but that's not something I'm interested in. Is it trying to emulate a specific kind of fiction? Well, I know that, you know, all these weird story games that I play, or even not story games, but like Free League stuff, you know, or a lot of Modifius' stuff, which is not a traditional kind of story game, yep. does a better job of emulating the genre that a specific game wants to emulate, right? Like, I have... I have uh, uh, Free League's uh, Blade Runner, right? And it's amazing. So it, it, like, it it's feels so like Blade Runner. Yep. So you get all these people who are like, okay, so what if I play Blade Runner with Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition? Like, well, no, why don't you play Blade Runner, right? Why don't you pick something that is meant to emulate the specific kind of fiction? Now, I appreciate that that's not a, a, a mode of thinking about games that works for everybody, right? Yep. You know, they want to emulate physics, you know, in some kind of broadly construed way. I want to know how much fall damage I take and stuff like that. That's totally good. It's just not what I'm interested in. And so with, with my groups, um, you know, particularly the one now where the only frame of reference they had was uh, uh, Dungeons and Dragons coming in. Um, they, I think they didn't like that. I, I, you know, I think that, I think they wanted kind of kind of genre emulation and didn't know it until they had games. They didn't know that what they didn't, didn't know. do it, you know. So when you're when you introduce something like Apocalypse World for somebody who's only ever played Pathfinder before or D&D before, what do they struggle with? What do you what's the what's the hump you have to push them over to make them really start to to to, to start to play? That's a really good question. So so my answer is kind of a cop out which okay. is I don't start them with that. I start them with fiasco. I do oh, a fiasco one shot <laughs> and literally every single time I, I'll, I'll tell the story. I had, I had a good friend and I decide, you know, I'm playing in Greensboro with my brother and some people, this is like 12 years ago and we're playing labyrinth Lord. And I think that we were going to, Oh, we were moving on to something and I can't remember what. And you know, he would, he, he was very much like a pathfinder player, very much like a miniatures and map guy. 
and he wasn't doing the role playing part of it. Right. Mm. And I think that that's kind of the hard thing to balance. Right. It which is. is you need to speak in character. Right. It doesn't mean that's all you do. And it doesn't mean you don't roll dice and stuff. But there's this really elegant dance you do when you're a game master of kind of knowing when to shift gears. And he just wasn't able to like get in that mode. So one day we're like, okay, we're going to play fiasco. Right. That's awesome. we get the play set and stuff like that. Cause we don't have anything prepared. This guy was amazing. He was really? full on in character. He was doing, uh, you know, a full on like Coen brothers, fuck up kind of character movie, stuff like that. He was taking on the, the other roles and stuff like that, that he needed the supporting cast easily. And oh, but, it was well, hold, magic. On a second. hold on a second though. Why? So, the, so, uh, and, and, and I want to hear you say like, so he struggled doing it in this one book, you know, bookend, right. And in, yeah. in, in this, right. He couldn't make that transition at the gaming table with dice in front of him. You put cards and a piece of cardboard in front of him, and suddenly he's kicking ass with it. Like what, what was, what changed? He didn't have to think about the rules. Interesting. You know, I, 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 I don't think rules light solves everything, right? Right. But rules light plus kind of forcing you and guiding you. And I think this is what apocalypse world does into these genre specific and appropriate actions gets you into a different mode of mm. thinking entirely. He wasn't thinking about the dice he needed to roll. He wasn't thinking about min maxing his character. He wasn't thinking about leveling and what feats he was going to take. Right. He wasn't thinking about what he couldn't do because <laughs> this is, this is the thing, right? Like yeah. when, when you get pathfinder, right? So like if, if you go back to OSR stuff and, I want to swing from a, from a chandelier, right? This is, this, this is the example I was given one time. I want to swing from a chandelier. Okay, let's roll your dexterity or something like that. You're doing it on the fly. You don't have to think about it, okay? Yep. Pathfinder, Dungeons and Dragons, stuff like that. It's when, when we look at a character sheet and we say, okay, I've unlocked this stuff that I can do. Implicit in that is the negative, that there's right. all these things that I can't do. Right? Yeah. So you can just kind of free people from that by saying like mm. with Fiasco, no, you can do anything. Right. This is just kind of an improv exercise. You can kick it up with a little more rules complexity, which is apocalypse rule, which is you can do anything, but we are only going to roll dice in these specific instances when you trip the trigger. Right. And you don't need to worry about, oh, I need to trip this trigger or that trigger. Right. I tell you, right. At least with, at least with the basic moves. Right. In every single apocalypse world game, I will let you know. Right. And that's the only thing that I'm here to do because, uh, you know, you are here to entertain me. You know, that's that's the secret advice that Vincent told me when I asked him. I said, hey, you know, like, you know, how does how does this work? And, you know, I'm going to make a game. He said, the secret is, is that every role playing game is made for the game master to entertain the players. And I got sick of that. And now the players are here to to entertain me. And like, you asked them. So true. Yeah, he's like, he's like, you go to a bar. No, like you tell them to tell you what that shit looks like. Yeah. You don't worry about it. Yep. Yeah, it's um, it's funny because uh, in, in my transition and learning old school way of running games, sleeping for 20 years and coming back, I think one of the things I've recently unlocked is that freedom and the ability to walk into a session and go, OK, I know the world. I know the players. I know what the players that are not. Uh, the NPCs, right? I know what they all want. I know what's happening. I know I know what's happening out here. I've got my agents of chaos. Those are my four players that have walked into this world and are going to F everything up. I'm starting this session right now. I have no idea what's about to happen. Yeah. I, I don't know. I don't know where they're going to go. What I've put 10 threads in front of them. They might pull one of them. They might make their own thread and pull it. And it's an adjustment because it's a different way to think about this. And I love that embodiment that you said that Vincent gave you, which is, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to play too. Yeah. Yeah. That's really the thing. And and it was very freeing for me because, you know, like I said, I'm the perpetual game master and I don't mind doing it. Even when I have to do the prep work and stuff like that, I really enjoy it uh, because I like watching people play. Um, But uh, it it was very nice to play it and kind of outsource it to other people, (laughs) you you know, like, yeah, that's not my job, man. (laughs) 
<laughs> That's so cool. So guys, the Insider Insight series is, allows me to sit down with designers, developers, artists, writers, and creators and learn how they approach their work. I try and understand their process, inspiration, and methods for crafting their creations. That's exactly what we're going to do with Ian. We're going to talk about his one big game. We're going to talk about Action Movie World. We'll be right back. This is the part of many podcasts where someone comes on, interrupts the show, and explains that you should consider paying for the content that you're listening to right now for free. That pitch man explains by giving a dollar or more a month, you not only support the show, but you allow the show to grow and improve. Here on the third floor, we refuse to interrupt your episode of Tabletop Talk with such time-wasting pleas. We pledge never to run a spot asking you to go to patreon.com and give a dollar or more a month because supporting content creators keeps the content coming, even if there is a link in the show's description. And there is. We don't ask you to click it and become a patron. We don't waste time rambling about the benefits like early access to episodes, getting episodes without ad breaks like this, or even getting a chance to play in one of Craig's RPG sessions. Anyway, Enjoy this episode knowing Tabletop Talk, despite being supported by its patrons, won't engage in such blatant appeals for support. So you normally, you know, what I do when I start talking about the game itself is I make you go back in time and tell me about the origins we kind of covered the origins of where the idea came from and, and kind of where it was born so i want to pick up from where we left off in the first segment which is you got this idea it's garbage you throw it away someone tells you a better idea you throw that away until you think about it what's next so now you've got this idea of what if we're playing the actors what's the first step um so I think with all Apocalypse World engine games, what you have to think about, you know, because again, uh, just to reiterate this, I think this is the most important thing. So I've seen a couple uh, such games. I won't name them because I don't necessarily think they're bad, but I'm not going to say something great about them, which is they don't understand that what it is, is it's very explicit about pick a genre, you know, mm. whatever it is. And ha- what is important to that? You don't need to model anything else. That's all that matters in Apocalypse World in games. So that's what I did. I thought, okay, so first of all, what matters in action moves? And there were kind of two sets. Okay, so first off were the moves, right? So we had to have fights and explosions and love scenes and uh, cool one-liners. You know, this is the kind of stuff that you would model. Second thing was, was what is kind of meta important about the genre in a specific kind of way, which is, okay, the hero always wins, okay? Pretty much everybody else dies. They're disposable. <laughs> right. So that makes for a really, that potentially makes for a really lame game, right? But then I thought, okay, look, what if everybody gets to be the main character? Because, you know, if you are playing a set of, action movie heroes then you kind of rotate right and then everybody gets to be the main character and everybody gets to do that and then everybody else gets to die and you know so so, so that kind of solves that problem so it was just kind of this narrow focus on what is important to action movies right and then kind of corollary to that and it's a little less important because you're actually playing the movies we kind of flirted with doing in between uh session stuff in this uh kind of codified in more complex way, like uh, doing PR for a movie, right. um, you know, stuff like that. And we kind of didn't do that, but corollary to that is what's important to the way that the action movie industry, at least in the eighties and nineties worked. All right. So you, so you've parsed that out, right? So you've, you've laid that all out. You've got notebooks and you've filled this up with these ideas. You've tar- you started to boil them down. Do you make playbooks at that point? What, what's next? Yeah, so once I had the basic moves, um, well, you know, I, I, thinking back, it's been a while, but um, I think at the same time that I was doing the basic moves, I was thinking about kind of archetypal action movie 
stars. And there's not that many, right? I think that I covered my bases pretty well, right? So you got like, you got a beefy guy. It's like Arnold Schwarzenegger. Uh, you got kind of a cool wisecracking guy, right? So that's uh, Bruce Willis. Uh, yeah, Bruce Willis. Mel Gibson. Um, yeah, you've got, um, you know, kind of a kind of a shifty ninja type, right? Mm-hmm. So like, you know, action, you know, kind of Bruce Lee. Um, I don't mean to collapse uh, uh, all kind of like East Asian movie stars into like one. No, 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 no but I know what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, you know, Kung Fu martial arts. Um, you've got a suave guy. Yeah. You know? All right. So you got him. Um, and then um, I'm trying to go through all of them uh, by memory, which is like more difficult <laughs> than I thought it would be. Um, but the one that I insisted on was not actually an archetype, which was I'm a huge Red Brown fan. Um, he's the guy who played um, probably his most well-known known work is Space Mutiny because there was an MSD3K episode about it. Uh, and he played the main guy, Big, Big McLarge Huge, as he's commonly known. And like all he does is yell. Like, if you watch Reb Brown movies, he plays the exact same character every time. So he's kind of archetypal, right? Even if he's just singular, right? There's only one of yep. them. Literally, all he does is yell. And I thought, well, I love Reb Brown. And I could make him a beefy guy, or I could just make him a guy who yells a lot, right? And that turned out to be the most popular playbook. That's one that everybody <laughs> bought on to. Yeah, it's got to be a lot of fun to play. <laughs> oh, yeah. Our, 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 our first play test... I get together with uh, uh, Peter uh, Williams, my brother, and John Cocky, and they're the guys who run Flatland, and they'd said, yeah, we'll publish it. We'll do a 50-50 split, whatever. It's like, cool. Um, and it was Peter's birthday, and I said, okay, so let's let's play test what I got here. And it's like, okay. And we were picking playbooks, and uh, he said, I kind of want to be the yeller. And I was like, listen, it's your birthday. You get to be the main character, and you can be the yeller. And by the end of it, he's... He's not a very loud man, right? I'm the loud <laughs> brother. I have a big projecting voice. I was a theater car- a theater kid and stuff like that. And like by the end, he was worse. Like he could not oh. because he just yelled for three hours. And I was like, oh, we got something here, right? So, you know, we're just kind of hitting these archetypes. We've got the moves set. And then everything else just kind of fell into place. You know, once you get that, then you're just kind of thinking about like, what's the flow of an action movie? Right. You know? which was the next thing, which is, you know, they've got that stuff about kind of like pacing of scenes. And if you're doing something kind of cinematic uh, genre emulation, you need to think about that. And of course it's just one of the, one of the underlying uh, design things is that like, I really do hate long sessions. Right. And I didn't, <laughs> I didn't want to, I mean, I'm old, you know, I, it, and you know, even, even at like 35, which is I, I, when I think how old I was when this came out or something like that, you know, I, I I've got a young daughter, you know, I'm, I'm going back to school and like all this stuff. Um, and I was like, Oh God, I just, I don't have time for an all day. Yeah. Anymore, you know, I don't even, we don't have, have whole the- Saturdays to no, devote to this. I don't like, sometimes I got two hours. Right. So yeah. I was like, Oh, actually this works because an action movie, it, that shit's always like an hour and a half long max. Right. Sometimes it's like an hour and 10 minutes. Right. It's like the bare minimum to be considered a movie by, yeah. you know, the, the kind of regu- soft regulations around it. And what they do is it's just about let's get stuff done, right? There's no lingering on shots or anything like that. It's like fade to black, you know, uh, you know, dissolve, go to the next place. Oh, you're 3,000 miles away. How do we know that? There's a helicopter, right? <laughs> okay. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll figure it out, right? Yeah. So there was this idea where I was like, I don't want this to be a one shot, but I want every movie, you know, every session to be a movie. Right. And I need it to be fast because I don't have time to fuck around. So you, there, there's when I first came across your game and and I read the back of the book and, um, you know, t- I tried to understand it. There's a bunch of squares that I needed circled. Um, and I want to talk about how you circled them, because I think it's very interesting. The first one is you've kind of hinted at it. If we're emulating the genre of action movies, there is Bruce Willis. There is Patrick Swayze. There is Arnold Schwarzenegger. And now you're a GM with four people at the table, right? So how do we emulate the action hero genre with an ensemble? How did you handle that? Well, okay. So the first thing I thought about is that, you know, so for instance, you just did the thing that indicates what the solution is, which is Patrick Swayze plays Patrick Swayze. And Bruce Willis plays Bruce Willis. And Arnold Schwarzenegger plays Arnold Schwarzenegger. Down the line. There is not a major action movie star who whatever role they're in, minor or major, is not playing themselves to some extent. Right. There's this kind of, 
uh, you know, a, this, this kind of Venn diagram as a circle between character and actor there, right? So you don't need to worry about necessarily. I mean, it's it's a little gamey because action movie stars tend to be singular. It's an Arnold mm-hmm. Schwarzenegger movie. It's a Sly Stallone movie. Whatever. Okay, fine. Just just make the other supporting characters, right? Just figure it out. It's 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 kind of gamey. It doesn't perfectly match up. You give people experience if they die, and you say, hey, you get to, like, intervene now, because now you're kind of behind the scenes as an assistant director, right? And you can intervene in different ways to give you something to do once you're dead, because you don't just want to sit there, right? That's right. That's the old Shadowrun, I'm the, uh, uh, I'm the Decker problem. Uh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. okay. The other four guys are just going to sit around. <laughs> There's five of us that'll play Shadowrun. You four and then that guy. <laughs> yeah, right. Bingo, right. Um, so, you know, I, I wanted to avoid that. But yeah, it was just this idea that, okay, everybody gets a rotation in the spotlight. So nobody's going to be left out, right? Which means, you know, you kind of got to admit, if you got a group of four, which is, you know, average-ish, you need to do at least four sessions. So everybody gets to be the main right. star. That's fine. You know, yep. I sell more books that way. It's all, it's all good. <laughs> um, but yeah, every, everybody else is kind of supporting. And it's just this idea that, you know, always give them something for dying and not being the main star. And that was like surprisingly easy. Like, I, I don't know that anybody, nobody's complained to me about that. Well, well the thing I found interesting about Ian is that it, it ties into kind of that original second idea you got, which is I'm not playing John McClane. I'm playing Bruce Willis, right? So I can be the co-star. I can be the secondary person. And that idea that the movies rotate around um, is, is absolutely fantastic. Um, and, and I love that solution. Uh, and I thought it was extremely clever. And, and again, totally taps into the genre. It totally leans into it, right? Um, which I think is fantastic. So here's the other square um, that I want to know how you circled, which is, we've listed how many times we listed action heroes. I've never talked about Scorny Weaver. Mm -hmm. I never, right. So, so how do you handle um, gender in in all of this? And, and the fact that typically we think of in a first, at the first level, when we talk action heroes, we think Schwarzenegger sliced alone and all the other names we have, there's an entire secondary level of incredible women uh, action heroes. How does that work from a playbook standpoint for you? Um, it doesn't change anything. And and, right. and my solution was like fairly simple because I wanted to be inclusive and like recognize that, which is one, very simply, I I, I used gender neutral language, right? Or, or, or gender neutral as I understood it at the time. I probably used they pronouns today, but I used yeah. he or she. And I, I, I made absolutely certain that before we went to print, I said every single instance needs to be that. Um, the second thing was, was that I gave examples, two examples at the top of every playbook of a real life person that was that, right? And I always made sure that there was a man and a woman, right? Which I thought Everything. was really cool. Right. Jean-Claude Van Damme or Cynthia Rothrock. You know yeah. what? They play the same character for the most part, <laughs> yeah. right? So like, that's, that's one of the things is that even, um, you know, if, 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 if you feminize these roles, like they largely behave the same way, right? They still make things explode. They still kick the shit out of people. They still express love and affection in a very physical manner. They still laugh. Right. Um, so, um, yeah, that was, that, that was to me at least surprisingly simple. And I, I, because, um, that, that is the way that action movies work. Like it is traditionally male, but I don't like under no circumstances. I mean, Cynthia Rothrock is awesome. (laughs) Right. And criminally underrated today. Right. You know, she, she was never in like the good action movies, but the good action movies are less interesting to me than like the VHS stuff that I just pick up, you know, at the local video store when I was yep. you know, 12 years old. Um, and Cynthia Rothrock was all over that stuff. Yeah. So I was like, no, I want to, I want to make certain that, you know, people can play Cynthia Rothrock if they want. And it's, you know, it's, it's pretty easy because she, because she checks those archetypal boxes. Yeah. And, and, it, and it's something that I noticed that I really, and I, it's the reason I wanted to call it out, Ian, is that, it's twofold, right? So when I went through the playbooks and we talked, you should talked about the examples and you did a great t- job of offering two solid examples. It, it wasn't just a, Oh, here's a man and a woman. Here's a man and a woman. It's man. And a woman. W- what it made me realize is, yeah, they are both belong to this playbook. And 
and it, it expanded my mind a lot as far as what I thought of what this genre was. And it's, it, it, and I, th I thought it was a very clever and subtle way to handle that. Um, so, so well done on that. Now, if I go sit down and play apocalypse world today, and then tomorrow night you run action world for me, what is the big difference I'm going to see? between playing Apocalypse World and playing Action World. So it's built off of Apocalypse World, but it's not Apocalypse World. What did you keep? What did you change? Um, I kept a few moves where there was overlap. Um, I remember, let me think. Uh, I'm trying to think. I always hate these questions. because So like, I'm, I'm sure that when you interviewed Jason uh, Morningstar, he said something to the effect, maybe not verbatim, that he makes games that he wants to play. Correct. Right. That nobody designed and he wanted to play them at his table. I am the absolute opposite of that, which is <laughs> I already know how I would play it. I want people, I want you to play it. Right. Interesting. And I want to hear the stories about it. Right. I want to hear what you do with it. So how does that inform the design then? That's interesting. Um, I don't know that it really did. I mean, okay. other than, other than, I mean, I mean, obviously I played it, right. Cause I play tested the shit out of it. Right. Right. Um, and I've I've not played it much since then, except when uh -huh. I'm kind of like showing it off to somebody who's like curious or something like that. Um, but I keep track of the stories, like you know, every now and then people will tell me, right? And and like really, what I wanted to do, and this may be the main difference, is like Apocalypse World can be grim, you know. It's yes. like it, you know, it's 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 bloody, and there is this kind of inherent over the topness to it. Yep. Action movie world, like you know, I I tell people, I, it may even be somewhere in the uh, on the website. It's a stupid role playing game. I mean, it's, I mean, it's dumb. I mean, I think it has some smart things to say, right. You know, uh, uh, to, you know, not to toot my own horn, but uh, about the way action movies work, because I think that the, the kind of analysis of them is a little bit limited, right. right. You know, as, as, as I said at the top, um, but I want people to do stupid things with, it, right. That's fun to me. I, I want to hear about your stupid action movie where everybody blows up, right. Or you come up with a scene where, um, you know, you run into the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles or something, right? Like, you know, you run with that and like, tell yeah. me about it. Cause I, I sincerely love hearing about it. Um, so, you know, I always kind of have to have, have to go back, which is, um, uh, I changed the way experience worked. I remember that. Um, uh, I hope I'm not making myself sound like a dumbass here, but I'm, I'm trying to think back to the, well, and everybody's going to have to buy the book to, 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 to check I'm you, right? You, don't you think? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah the, that beer money trickling in, you know, we've got weekly happy hours. I got to go, I got to go and, and, and do it. Um, but, it, but it, you know, so like, like six buckets, six bucks at top of the hill. Come on. <laughs> I don't go there. I got, I, I go to Linda's. You know. Nice. Um, I am amazed my Linda hand. still exists. <laughs> come shake my hand. Don't come with a gun because you hate action movie world. Right. But, you, but you'll find me there but anyway. Um, you know, action movie world. It was okay. Each person, like you pick a stat that interests you and the other person, uh, you know, picks a picks a stat for you that they think. Is interesting. Well, action movie stars don't like do things that they're not good at. You know, right. that's kind of the point of it. So yeah. I was like, look, you get experience for rolling your highest skill, uh, you, you know, your, your highest stat. Like, just just roll that. If if you're a muscle head and your highest stat is your your you know being beefy and strong. Like, that's what I want you to do. I want to incentivize you to do that, right? Which means you get better at it, and then you do bigger, grander, and hopefully stupider things with it, right? <laughs> like, and, and that's what people do, right? Well, Nobody, the game I, gives you that permission. The game says, this is what the game is. Yeah, absolutely. I, I just, you know, um, uh, a friend of mine, a guy I've known online for a long time, Daniel Swinson, he actually started a blog. Like, you know, he was, he was so enamored of Action Movie World, and this was very flattering. He was like, I'm going to do a live play blog. And it was wonderful. I loved to read it. Um, you know, he did it for like six months a year or something like that. And every time it popped up, I would read it. And it was just like, oh, yeah, no, just, just give me more of this. So as you've been curating these stories, being so interested in seeing how your game is being played. Um, as you go through that collection of yours. When were you the most surprised? When did somebody take your game and put it or take it to a place that you hadn't designed for and you weren't, you're like, Oh yeah, I guess you can do that with my game. Uh, what surprised you the most as you read these? Like, cause I'm, I'm sure there was many that didn't surprise you. You're like, yeah, you're playing actual world and that's awesome. Right. I'm not taking away from those, but if you ever, ever 
like collected this stuff as active as you are with it and gone, Oh shit, that's kind of cool. Yeah. There were, so one of the, one of the places that, that we didn't really flesh out was kind of those edge kind of action movies. Uh, mm. So we're talking about like edge case where really it's kind of like cross genre. So like okay. a drama action movie or um, something very space opera um, or something very like horror related. So people started doing some hybrids of those here and there. And that was always interesting. Right. It was less stupid. <laughs> than I intended, uh, you know, than, than like I intended, but it was cool to see people do that. Yeah. You know, I, as far as like new playbooks and stuff, I don't know that anybody came up with that, but um, you know, they didn't have to, which is, I think that that's flattering to me. Right. It means that I did my job that even though you're doing something different with it, like the, you know, the core, design loop of it you know what you play how you play it is still strong so i take action world and i run it for my buddies this weekend um i uh shoot you an email and say hey i want i want to give you a call right so i, I, sure. I call you up ian and i said uh, just got done playing and then i tell you a bunch of stuff what could i tell you to let you know you succeeded what would you like to hear me say to go fucking nailed it you could say anything as long as you laugh. Mm -hmm. If you laugh when you're telling me the story, right? That tells me that I did a good job with it. That's cool. Right. Yeah. I think, uh, you know, that's, that's always the stuff, right? Is that I, I think like, um, you know, it, it, humor in games, like, like there's not a lot of humorous games. Mm -hmm. they're, they're, I, you know, I think they're hard. To Says do. the Warhammer player, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Well, you know, we're going to depend on what, like, what edition, you know, th there is humor in there. But yeah, um, so, so if somebody tells me the story and, like, they laugh or they write it and they're like, this was really funny when, yeah. you know, Rob, like, Rob blew up, you know, or, you know, that's the kind of thing. Yeah. Um, or if there's, like, melodrama, right? Like, I, like, like I love, if, if you were to tell me, okay, so I was playing a supporting character and I got shot and I delivered this really dramatic speech and then I gave like a really loud, uh, over, overly dramatic death rattle. Like, yeah, that's it right there. Cause that's, you, that's always the best stuff. You got it. You got it. So, um, after I played the game that weekend, um, I broke into your house. Oh, no. Um, and I stole a bunch of notebooks and by, by chance I found, the last notebook before playtest, And then of course on my shelf right now, I've got action world and I'm, I'd be curious to know the impact of playtest for you. So if I were to compare the condition action world was before you put it on a table for non brother, non, right? Like you actually play yeah. tested the shit out of this game. What changed over that process? What difference would I see between the printed book on my shelf right now and the play and the uh, notebook I stole? The thing that changed the most, the moves were pretty well, uh, uh, well kept up, I think, um, uh, on, on an early pass, right? I think that like, you know, I got that right early. It was, it was how to, um, handle the ensemble cast thing that mm -hmm. I think went through the most iterations, like, um, the assistant director roles where when somebody dies and they can, you know, watch and then intervene in certain, in certain areas, um, uh, kind of off off screen, right? Uh, that came very late in the process because what we realized was that the experience that you get for dying isn't enough, right? Because right. it still leaves this problem of people just sitting around and they're only content, <laughs> even if they're invested, they're only going to do that for ten minutes before they're yeah, just like, "This is not diplomacy yeah, and risk." Right? I gotta <laughs> I gotta cut out, you know. I'm I'm, I'm leaving early, right? Mm -hmm. Um. So so those were the biggest changes. That's cool. That's cool. So the other thing that I like to do, well, actually, before I, before I move to the next segment, I want to talk a little bit about deleted scenes. I want to get sure. a sense of why it exists. Again, when did you go? I need to do one more thing. Let's talk quickly about where it came from and what it is. Um, so that was actually something that um, John Cocking at, at Flatland approached me about. So one was simply like, hey, you know what? Like, do you want to do a supplement? Because I think you're selling well enough that like it would do OK. Um, so there was like this very, you know, business oriented thing. Uh, and what would you want to do it about? And we talked and this is funny. So John was like, I, I really like all the playbook. <laughs> he said, but I really like playing old guys. And this, and this is something mm -hmm. about John, like John only plays old guys. I've known him for 
25 years, every single time I have ever played any role-playing game with him, he's like, I'm going to play an old guy, right? And so he's like, I want a playbook so I can play an old guy. So that's that's kind of where it came from. Is like, how do we fill out a book? And like, you know, because yes, it, it, it was a hole in, in, in there, yep. right? Like Bruce Willis is Bruce Willis, and I know he just retired, but Bruce Willis now is not Bruce Willis in 1992, Correct. right? Um, he changes. And then there was the idea of, well, how do you get, can you get from one playbook to that, right? Mm-hmm. So like after you play several movies, can you become that? Well, how about the inverse? Can you start as like a child actor and then like move up to oh. playbooks? Um, what other genres do we have holes in, right? That 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 could use, you know, the kind of setting playbook that you use to, to, to give you temporary moves that like, you, know, you use. Um, so, so, so it was really just kind of plugging a few holes. Like, you know, we were we were very content with the action movie world design. Mm hmm. But nothing's complete, right? You've got a page count, and then there's just stuff that you just forget, you know? Yeah. You just think, like, ah. Or it's, like, kind of secondary, right? Because, like, you know, most action stars, you know, action movie stars are young. Yep. You know, there's not a lot of old guys who are still still working the action movie circuit. So it was just kind of like, well, do I need to do that? Probably not, you know? But then, yeah, you know, it was it, it was one of those things that we, uh, we checked together, um, I'm kind of doing it probably an injustice because, you know, the Flatland guys, you know, they're friends, but they do a very, very good job uh, kind of proofreading, editing, setting things up. So. Well, I, I can tell you that and listeners know I don't always say this, so this will give you a sense of the sincerity. It's a really good book, man. It's a really good book to read. It's well, it's well laid out. Um, the rules are exactly where I need them to be. Um, and it's, it's very clear. So yeah, whether that was you or them, it doesn't matter. It, like it's a smart book, uh, in, in that respect. Thank so you. this is going to lead me to, um, I'm going to ask you a transition question. Sure. As we get to our last segment, which is you obviously have a passion for the eighties and nineties and early 2000 action movies. Otherwise this game wouldn't exist. Are these Marvel movies, action movies? Oh gosh, that's a good question. Um, no, and why and I, not? I, I think that we're in a we're in a world where theatrical distribution is so dire for mm. most movies that pretty much everything that gets a wide release is an action. And if everything's right. an action movie, I I would kind of argue nothing's an action movie. It's it's mm. it's it's, it's it's now indistinct, right? An action movie is just an action movie, you know? Um, It's kind of like how for a long stretch, everything, you know, everything that was popular on the radio was rock and roll, you know, through like the eighties and, you know, most of the nineties, at least half the nineties. Right. So, so at some point you're just kind of talking about like, kind of like, well, is it worthy of commentary? Mm -hmm. You know? So no, I, I I don't think that they're action movies, at least the way that I conceive of action movies as a genre. They have action in them, certainly. Correct. Right. So uh, that being said, because, you know, there were there were there was when we were kids, there was video stores and VHS and that that delivered to us a whole like backroom avenue of movies that that the generation before us didn't have access to. Right. Like VHS opened it up and suddenly we got access to all kinds of it's first time foreign movies were available to us in the in the states because of blockbuster and, and the and the in the family video store and you know i worked in a video store so like i watched all of them right mm-hmm. and it ex- totally expanded my views and understanding of movies and things like that and and i'm now realizing we're kind of in that age again in a different way because of streaming right we're now getting access to media from all over at multiple different levels and we're seeing a new funding of non-theatrical entertainment. So that being the case, what is the most, as you see it, what is the most action movie movie you've seen recently that, that captures you? So we've said Marvel, not it. Mm-hmm. What is the most action movie, action movie you've seen recently? Oh my gosh. Um, Boy, you regret think- coming on this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> That's a tough question. Probably the Fast and the Furious stuff. Mm-hmm. Right. I, I, I think that one of the things that's intrinsic to uh, action movies is uh, a certain level of practical effects yeah. that are still there. Um, and that's not to diminish uh, the skill of really good uh, CG artists and stuff like that. Um, but it's just 
different, right? I need to believe there's there's something where you kind of have to believe that the action movie it's it's like pro wrestling, right? Which is something yeah. I spent a lot of time writing about, thinking about. But there's this way that action movies are are a lot like pro wrestling where you kind of have to not know if the action right. movie star is in real danger or not, you know, when that explosion happens, when they're jumping out of a plane, all that stuff. Um, so, you know, the, the Fast and the Furious stuff still has that little bit of like practical edge, you know, the real cars and they're really driving fast and stuff like that. So I think, I think that's probably the closest. For yeah. And, and it's, and it's, and that can be very powerful. The, the practical fast. I think it um, has, been part of what has kept me interested in um with with what what's his nuts is doing at disney plus with like mandalorian and stuff mm-hmm. like that kind of bringing the practical facts back into star wars um and this is going to be a i'm going to lose my four listeners by saying this um <laughs> fury road right good example yeah so well but you're not going to like me after i get to oh, say no. this i think it's a bad movie okay really well i'm not done though okay. like like, I think it's a bad movie, but I'm so excited that the movie was made. So glad I saw it in the theaters and love so many things about it. I just think it's not a good movie. Right. But the, and and. And again, I, like I, I, nobody's listening now, but um, <laughs> but what, what's key, though, and the reason I bring it up is the practical effects and the action movie, action movie aspect of Fury Road for me carried the whole goddamn thing oh yeah and and made it made it all worth it and made me love the movie and i'm glad i saw it and so on and so forth and it it, to the point where at at its heart i think it's a bad movie not only that i think it's a bad mad max movie but um but i love the but i'm trying to reinforce your point which is that 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 sense of real the grit and the danger that as good as CGI is, it's not quite there yet to carry that. Yeah. And, and like, listen, I'm, I'm sincerely a bad judge because in all sincerity, I love bad movies without a hint of irony more (laughs) than good movies. I I really do. There's something honest about them, right? Very much That just, there's, you know, and like they're invariably there. One of my favorite movies is Samurai Cop. Right. And I saw Samurai Cop, which is that's VHS shit right there. It's a it's it's so bad. Right. But it's so good. And it's made by this um, by this Iranian guy who who moves over to the States. And like literally you watch this and basically the only thing you can figure is that everything he knows about American culture and maybe the way that he learned English is by watching Lethal Weapon a lot. Right. (laughs) And there's something like it's it's fucked up right it's a fucked up movie but there's right. something so honest about it and there's something so compelling about like not having a dime to your name it's kind of like um the documentary american movie right where like people have two reactions like oh my god look at these fucking losers right this is about post industrial you know <laughs> loserdom and these guys like kind of deserve to lose and i watch it and i think no this guy had a dream right yep. and like maybe it wasn't great you know but like also there's something so honest about wanting to like do that with just the few tools that you have. And that's why I love bad movies, right? No matter how ugly and weird and obscene and unpleasant they may be. And like, honestly, like a lot of them are, it's just that craft and that wherewithal to like, go do it. That's what I love. Right. So, so when is a bad movie, a bad movie for you? Um, well, okay. The other two listeners are going to leave me when it's a Marvel movie. <laughs> Like I really? fucking hate Marvel you are, movies. Oh, interesting. I detest them. from the beginning I, or what they became from the beginning. Like I've really? never been into, I've never been into superheroes. Um, I like superhero media and stuff. That's not movie and comic books. It's weird. I like superhero role-playing games. I like superhero miniatures games. I like superhero video games, everything else. Like I could, I, I can like do the without cartoons. No, no interest. No, don't like the cartoons. Yeah. Um, it's just not like, it's not something like that's like visual in that way. So what, so what are they missing that, that, that you're capturing in those other media? Why does it work in video games? Why does it work in the books? But as soon as I put it on screen, it doesn't work for you anymore. This is, this is like a two-tiered answer. Um, uh, one, I can see the political economy of them a little too clearly. Interesting. Right? So like the CGI comes about because they don't want to hire uh, you know, union-based Hollywood yep. 
you know, guys. They're in, filming in, in Vancouver. Yep. Right. Uh, or, uh, or New Zealand, right. Where, yep. You know, post Hobbit, they, they did strike breaking. Um, uh, the idea of somebody just sitting in a green screen and like, you know, punching the air just like really turns me off. Yep. Um, I know they bring back obscure characters in comic books over and over and over again. So that way they don't lose their copyrights and nobody else can do something with, you know, whatever obscure, you know, elemental man or something. I don't, I'm sure there's an elemental man. I don't know. That that's for certain. Um, they just, uh, yeah, they just don't do it for me. Um, Takes you out. Yeah. It just, I, I cannot engage with them. But you enjoy, like you mentioned superhero role-playing games. Why yeah. can you, le- why do you lean in there? Because I love like making my own stupid he- superhero, right? That's that's the cool bit about superheroes to me, right? It's it's that thing. Um, remember Marvel heroic role playing that was I do out in print for like a minute, you yeah. know, and nobody knew why it went away. And the inkling that I got was that, that was the one with like the the tiles, right? It wasn't just dice. It was is that the one you drew from the bag? Um, not from the bag. What oh was God, it? There, it's been you know so what I'm long talking about. There was a weird mechanic in it. No, no, no. It, it wasn't that one. It was one that came out uh, like 2011, 2012. Okay? okay, keep going. And the dice that you rolled were like from a D4 to a D12, and it was based on like whether you bet whether you work best um, like solo in a duo or in a team. Oh, I didn't play this. Okay, okay. Yeah. interesting. It was it, it was Margaret Weiss Productions, right? It literally had like three books, like main book and two supplements. One of which only came out in PDF before Marvel pulled it. Interesting and. The inkling that I heard through the grapevine from people who know people was that um, uh, I don't know why they pulled the plug other than it was just an enormously expensive license, Um, but that they did not Marvel Disney did not want to have character creation. They wanted you to play Mm. Spider-Man or Captain America because they statted out all the heroes, right? Like that was a big draw. And that's kind of the core of my objection. Right, which is I love playing my superhero, but like I don't want to play your superhero. And Marvel, uh, as an entity, is very, very invested for brand uh, yes. management reasons in you playing their superheroes or you watching their superheroes, reading about their superheroes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it just feels very constrained as a genre to me because of that. Well, and it's and it's hard for you to break the two apart, right, in your mind, right. which I completely get. So have you looked at Forbeck's uh, new Marvel game at all? No, I haven't looked at this. Uh, the 616 game. Um, okay. We'll talk about that off camera at some point when you get okay. a chance to yeah, look yeah, at yeah. it. Cause I, cause I have thoughts cause I'm a huge fan of, of Matt and, and Matt as a designer and a creator, but I have thoughts about his game. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> which I which say, I'll save at some point when I get him on the show, but go ahead. Yeah, I was gonna say by way of mitigation, you know, my daughter's a huge fan and I don't judge. And we have a uh, Marvel crisis protocol, which is their miniature. Yeah. Good game. It's a great game. Up now. Um, yeah, we're going to play the shit out of it. So, you know, I, I don't object it to it entirely. Um, you know, right. But it's just, you know, again, that well, visual well, medium feels Yeah, constrained. there's 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 places where it works for you and places where it doesn't. And that that that's very, very fair. It um, I mean, one of the best things about the Marvel movies for me. It's, so there's a couple things. Right. Had you gone back to 11 year old me and said, all right, here's what's going to happen in 40 years. There's going to be a Doctor Strange movie. There's going to be an Iron Man movie. And then they're going to do an Avengers movie. And then, and you're not going to believe this 11-year-old Craig, there's going to be a Guardians of the Galaxy trilogy. I would have told you to go after yourself. Like, I, I never in my, my wildest dreams would have dreamed that's happening. And now it's happening left and right, let alone a, a TV series for Moon Knight, right? I, I love that. So the the kid in me watches these and for whatever reason, I can let them go. Like, you yeah. know, I can, I can watch daredevil and go, that's not exactly my daredevil, but I like it. Like, but daredevil's there. And, and more importantly for me, my wife loves these movies. My wife who doesn't like action movies, doesn't like comic books, but Same she lo- and you know what? I'm in <laughs> like, we're going, we're going to go see Ant-Man. We're going to do all of it. And part of it is because it's allowed her to connect to my geekdom a little bit because that's a very different world uh, sure. from her. Um, but that doesn't discount anything that you said whatsoever. 
so now we're going to transition. We've talked about everything you hate. Um, and <laughs> like, and we've determined nobody's listening anymore because they heard me talk about Fury Road and you about Marvel movies. I do want to find out, though, and get a sense of what has gotten its hooks into you recently. So, Ian, is there anything that you have watched, played, read that like, that just and you know how that happens, right? Where you come across something and it could be a game, a book, a movie series or TV series. And you're like, um, I might call into sick tomorrow because I've got to I've got to keep going with this. What, what, what's the closest to that for you recently? Two things. One, there's a skirmish miniatures game, which is kind of a kind of a weird West thing. It's called Dracula's America. Oh, I with know Osprey. This. oh it's really good. Uh, three books. Osprey puts out good stuff. Yeah, yeah. And and that turn from where they did just like just kind of like military guides and stuff, like putting out their own games, and they got some emo stuff. But yeah, this one was like less popular, unfortunately, so it only got three books. But it's basically van- um, Dracula is the president of the United States. <laughs> Because he wormed his way to be vice president, right, and uh, uh, killed Abraham Lincoln, right. So it's it's very very influenced by more time in Necromunda, right. Interesting. Um, except a little more stripped down, right. It's got a very elegant system that you know my group has like tweaked a little bit, um, you know, in some ways. I'd be happy to share a house rules document with you, but you've got these very evocative gangs of which you know you play a supernatural gang, like you play the vampires who are like the tax men. Right, because Dracula needs blood, right? So yeah, yeah, you get three vampires, but the other guys in your gang, right? You can have up to like I think ten to twelve, like total. The other, the other dudes in your gang, like they're just cowboys and cowgirls, right? So you just oh, that's interesting. Go by like cow, cowboy and cowgirl miniatures. There's like Alistair Crowley's dad is running like a railroad concern. Um, uh, the Templars show up to fight Dracula. Um, there's like indigenous werewolves. I mean, you know, it, it, it plays into some tropes, right? Cause it's written right. by like an English guy and he doesn't, I think fully grok. You know, it, it's, 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 it's not outright sometimes offensive. Sometimes their but, take on America, like you were talking about with the samurai movie. Sometimes the outsiders take on America can be so informative. Yes. Right. Exactly. Um, but anyway, it's, it, it plays really, really fast too. Like you can get a game done in like 20 minutes. Anyway, it, you know, uh, you know, I play with my brother and, uh, and John and, you know, a couple other guys. Um, uh, and my brother has just gone completely wild on like MDF, uh, uh, cowboy town scenery. Um, so that's the first one. And we do that like monthly and we do like marathon and sessions. The other one is a video game called dark and darker. Um, God, I love it when I hear new stuff. I've not wow, heard that wow. either. Okay. So um, they've only been doing like these limited alpha tests, right? And they're going to go into early access. It's by a small Korean team, mostly uh, who got really frustrated with kind of like heavy monetization in the video game industry and stuff like that. You can get it on steam. It's a play test right now. And like whenever they have a play test, this is like literally all I do for a week. Um, are you familiar with Are you familiar with Tarkov? Escape from yes. Tarkov. Okay. Yeah. So I'm, pic- I'm not been involved with it at all, but sure. I'm familiar with it. Yeah. All right. So picture Escape from Tarkov. Okay. Right. But instead, it's in a dungeon. Okay. okay. All you you play like literally like carbon copies of the old school D and D classes. Right. You go in in a group okay. of three. Okay. You fight skeletons and stuff. You get gear, but there's other parties of three in there as well. And you have to escape. There's three different levels to the dungeon, right? Okay. Which you've only seen two. And you have a choice. You can escape. But only one escape portal pops up at a time. So you have to escape one at a time. Or you can go down a level all three. And it is the most exhilarating video game I have played in 10 or 20 years. And that's not Oh, that's cool. And, and is it all AI? Is it is it a single player? or No. No. It's, it's so like the, you, you know, the skeletons and goblins and stuff like that, like, those are NPCs, right? And right. AI, and they're very easy. The, the combat's kind of janky on purpose, right? So that way, so that way, <laughs> right like, up like your, your alley. <laughs> your gear matters a lot because of that, right? There's no like hopping around or anything like that. It's about like right. grinding for that gear and like that high tension. Can I escape? Because if you die, you like you lose everything. It stays in the dungeon. Um, but no, like like the other parties you run into or the other people, there there is a solo dungeon that they added this one. Right, which is like a little bit easier, a little bit smaller, but like there's other solo players in there. There's like ten other people in there with you, and they're either escaping or dying. Right, they're getting oh, that's down. interesting. Anyway, it, yeah, check out some streams of it. It is friggin' amazing. Like it's it's so good. Oh, so that's cool. Good. 
That's cool. Um, so in the miniature game front, um, the one that has, uh, so th- there's two that have hooked my interest the most, which is uh, MCP, okay. um, which, we, which we've already talked about. Uh, I think I still feel like the best competitive game out there is Malifaux by Weird Games. Love that game a ton. Um, though I think MCP is a um, arguably more elegant take on a lot. They took a lot from right. from from Malifaux, which I, would and that there's no regrets there, right? They also took a lot from um, uh, what's the other game? A second to forty k Privateer Press's game. Um, oh, uh, War Machine. Right. So, so yeah. the, cre- the, the, yeah, wow. warm hearts. Right. So, so the, the, the heart of the people who created MCP came from privateer press. Got right. It. So you, okay. so you see a lot of, uh, of that in there and they took some stuff from, from weird. And again, I'm not saying they stole, this is how you make games. Right. And they yeah. created an, an MCP and I'm anxious to talk to you about it after you've gotten some games under your belt. I think you'll see, especially from a de- designer's perspective, just how freaking clever they were in the, and the choices that they made, like there are choices that you're going to see and go and, Oh, like they just threw all that shit up. They're like, yeah. we're not going to deal with that. We're going to simplify it. And then you see it in play and you're going to like it, especially playing with um, somebody like, like, like your kids um, where they're not coming into it with the baggage you and I do playing Necromunda and 40 K and all that yeah, kind yeah. of stuff. But I, I want to real quick, I want to know if you've played Hutchinson's a billion sons. So the guy who made Gaslands. I'm uh, familiar with it. I've not played it. I, I adore gas. So you, okay. All right. No baloney. When we get done with this interview, go buy it. Okay. So just, just go buy it. It's like, I think the PDF is like something stupid under 20 bucks. Um, if, if you're like, if you read it and go, Craig is the biggest idiot, I will PayPal you or I'll meet you at okay. Linda's <laughs> and give you 20 bucks. So it, this, and I've had Mike on the show, um, already, but, I am arguing right now and I'm putting my stake in the thing that a billion sons will influence miniature design for the next 15 years. Fascinating. Okay. Okay. And, and that's coming from a guy who loved Gaslands. Yeah. Gaslands, forget Gaslands. A billion sons is a big deal. Yeah. It's a, it's a really big deal. And somebody like you who understands and loves miniatures enough, I think you're going to start reading and go, Oh, okay. I'll and check then, this out. Yeah. Then you're going to grab a bunch of, cause it's a PDF, right? There's no, there's no miniatures for it. So you just grab whatever starship miniatures you have from uh cosmic encounter or whatever, and you just pull them all together. And then you're going to start playing. You're going to go, Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> everything we've done before has changed. <laughs> okay. Cause so, like, I really felt that way about Gaslands. You know, and, and, well, and, and so, I'm not taking away from the the impact Gaslands had because Gaslands, we see Gaslands in uh, MCP, we yeah. see Gaslands influence. Um, what was the Fantasy Flight Star Wars um, Legion? Oh yeah, yeah, Legion. Yeah, yeah. there there is no Legion without Gaslands, right? Like uh, like w- w- we saw Mike put out his 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 pulse there. And that's that's why I'm trying to give you a sense of what I think. And, and you could like literally text me tomorrow, Ian, and go, Craig, like you have no idea what you're talking about. Okay. I could be wrong here, but this is this is the stake I'm putting uh, putting down and saying that I think a billion sons is a really big deal. And it's super excited for me to talk to you because I think you'll appreciate it and either vehemently disagree with me, which means we have a great discussion to have, <laughs> or you're going to be like, dude. <laughs> so, yeah. all right. OK. All right. So probably the was, latter. Yeah, I hope so. So th- those those were the um the, the games that we were talking about. You said there was also something else. Oh, um, no, it was just two games. <laughs> it was just the two games. That's it. It was just the two games. I, yeah, I mean, it's like so. Like, yeah, I'm weird. Uh, I, nothing you've been watching? No movies uh, lately that made you like go uh, ooh. Or, so uh, I it, it, my my media consumption is so weird, right? So like one, uh, you know, I I'm an academic, so I don't read for pleasure anymore. Like, and I haven't God, for so true. five years, like <laughs> I read, so true. I read philosophy books, you know, I enjoy that and there's something, but like, I don't just pick up a book and read anymore. Yeah. Um, and I, I'm always stuck in a loop on what I'm watching where I, I just kind of watch the same six, seven things that I've watched before, because usually when I watch something, it's on my computer screen or my desktop and yeah. I'm putting together miniatures or I'm painting. So it's something that like needs to be kind of comfortable that I'm like half paying attention to. Sure. Right? So it's always like, you know, a sitcom I've seen or like some, you know, an old wrestling match or something like that. So like, I don't have anything that interesting to say about, you know, and, and, and again, like, you know, they don't, 
make shitty old action movies right. that I love, you know, like they don't. So, um, you know, like, like nothing too new. It, it doesn't mean I don't watch new movies. It's just that like recently nothing's just, you know, grabbed hold of me. And yeah. And, 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 and you're answering the question, Ian, which is, is there anything new that's really excited you? And, and, and you've told us that, and it's okay if it's not a movie or a TV is show. It okay, any... Craig? Oh, oh, well, it's, you and I are going to have know, a long talk after this. So why I can't release this episode, <laughs> but <laughs> <laughs> You've completely just wasted two hours. But yeah. um, all right. So Ian, um, let's quickly uh, all the links. Everybody knows already. They can scroll down on their podcatcher. The links to everything sure. to buy Action World and everything are there. If they do want more, Ian, though, other than just buying your games, where should they go? Um, I spend too much time on Twitter, uh, <laughs> where I'm at Brock underscore Tune. If you know that reference, like I'm not a reference guy, but that is the greatest Saturday Night Live skit of all time. The Mr. Belvedere fan club. Um, that's mostly where you can find me. You can find my old writing. Like I said, I don't do a lot for public consumption anymore because I don't have time, but you can find my bylines. Uh, you know, again, Jacobin. Um, if you like pro wrestling, I spend a lot of time writing about pro wrestling advice um, and, and video games and analog games there as well. So those are the main two places if you want to catch up with stuff I've done. That's and you awesome. can find me at Linda's on <laughs> enough Fridays that like, you know, you can come say hi. Uh, upstairs or downstairs? Uh, usually upstairs, although we have been known to lurk downstairs as well. Downstairs. The, the basement ends up happening to all of us, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, it does. It does. <laughs> Maybe one of our listeners understands that reference. Okay. <laughs> um, Ian, there's a, there's a long list of really cool things to do on a Wednesday night in the triangle. Uh, but somehow I talked you into wasting two hours uh, talking to me. So I appreciate it, man. No, it was, it was great. And, uh, I love, I love chat and shop and just cool stuff and media and games. So it was not an imposition at all. I appreciate it. And, uh, for you listening, holy cow, it's the end. Like you listen to the whole damn thing. I appreciate you too. Take care. this episode subscribe to tabletop talk and share it with your friends check out our content on youtube and twitch follow us on twitter and facebook and stay updated on everything coming from third floor all the links are in the show notes take care floor heads Are you still here? Wow. Um, well, the episode is over, but if you're bored, why not go to patreon.com and support the show for as little as a dollar a month? Yeah, you can just scroll down. Scroll down and, yeah, get the link. It's Patreon that makes this and all of our other content possible. Don't you want to join the other floor heads on the Patreon Discord? Anyway... Thanks for sticking around. Take care.